All right. Uh, well, I don't promise to do any martial arts. I will, in fact, talk about the principles of visualization. Uh, so let me start out with a definition. Uh, if we're going to talk about what the principles are, let's say what it is that we are discussing. And my own current definition is computer-based visualization systems provide visual representations of data sets intended to help people carry out some task more effectively. So what are some of the implications of that statement? Well, one is there's data and there's people and there is some connection between them. So there is some human in the loop who needs the details about a data set. Now, you might ask, well, when do we need a human in the loop? It's when we either don't know enough to completely automate a system, or maybe we have a hypothetical way to automate that we have to validate before we go deploying it. And when do people need to see the details? Well, when the summary statistics alone don't tell you the full picture. So this is one of our favorite examples in visualization. It's Anscombe's Quartet, uh, which is four data sets specifically designed to have identical statistical properties up to and including the mean, the variance in both x and in y, the correlation. You can see uh, barely there's a linear regression line that's identical for all four. So you'd get a sense that they're all the same. But by looking at a picture, of course, you see once you see the full distribution, you can see, oh, in one case it's a weak correlation, in another case it's not even linear, one there's an outlier, and then the other there's an outlier and almost a pessimal distribution to try to confuse you about what's really going on with that data set. So although this is a caricature, a tiny data set with 20 uh, dots in it, what I want you to think of is what are situations in the real world where humans do need to know the rich characteristics of the distribution of the data set. Another aspect of this is we've got a visual representation. So what does that mean? It means we have chosen to have an external representation. So what we're trying to do is, whenever possible, swap in perception for internal resources of cognition and memory. So in contrast to that picture on the left, where we see a lot of dots, this picture on the right has a bunch of numbers. These happen to be microarray measurements for genes. And it's very difficult to immediately look at this and get the min, the max, characterize the trends, and that's because it is a cognitive act to read the numbers, store them in your mind, do internal comparisons. Instead, you want your visual system to do that for you, thus harnessing perception. Now, notice how there's the word task in my definition. That means there is some intended task. If all you have is data, that is not enough. You have to know what it is that you are drawing the picture to help people do. That intended task might be explicitly articulated really clearly or it might be more implicitly assumed, but it is in there. And finally, I said more effectively, and any time you use the word more, you have to say more compared to what. So there must be some measurable, measurable definitions of what we mean to be effective, and I'll be talking about some of that as the talk continues. So does it mean faster, easier, more correct, novel capabilities, all of the above? So there is a huge space of alternatives in the design space of visualization design. So think about all ways you might design a visualization. That's a ginormous space. Trade-offs abound. So of course, it's not just that you can completely optimize for everything you want. There's a trade-off here. Now, the good and the bad news is we know a priori <coughs> that many possibilities in that design space are ineffective. They do not do their job. They mislead and confuse rather than enlighten and help. So what you want to do is avoid a random walk through the parameter space of design possibilities. It will take a long time to get it right. Um, in fact, if you think about it in the language of computer science algorithms, it is literally an exponential space. Um, so what I am hoping I can convince you to do is to avoid some of the past mistakes of the InfoViz community. Because we had a youthful enthusiasm phase where we tried a lot of things, and it turns out only some of them worked. Uh, and we've done a lot of experiments to discover what works and what doesn't. So we were seduced by some things that perhaps you can guide yourself around. Um, now, these guidelines are not set in stone. They are most certainly continuing to evolve. One of the things we do in the Viz community to try to help get these guidelines to continue is to reflect on what we know, to do a design study where we explain in detail what's the problem we are trying to solve, and then discuss whether our proposed solution really actually did nail that, or whether there's something we learned that we didn't know, and we can incorporate that back into the space of design guidelines. So even for people that are quite aware of a lot of the currently known trade-offs, 
there's still a lot of refining to do. It's rare that we totally nail it on the very first try. Usually we end up doing some kind of iterative refinement where you build a system and then you watch the people use it. Sometimes you curse to yourself that you see they didn't quite do what you had in mind. But we do not just blame the user. We actually then go back and make the system better. So I picked seven principles to talk about today. Uh, there are, of course, more. But uh, these are the ones we're going to discuss, at least from my point of view, um, about knowing what visual channels are, the constraints of how many colors you can show at once, the power of planar position and the danger of 3D depth, uh, why resolution typically beats immersion, why the eyes beat memory, and the concept of validate against the right threat, not the wrong threat. So let me start out with this idea of uh, types. So before we talk visual channel types, we have to start out with some basics on data types. So here I've got a little taxonomy of data. So let's start with, I've got a spreadsheet and there's stuff in it. What might be in that data table? What might be the columns of my spreadsheet? If I think about the rows as being some kind of points or items, what could be in a column? Well, it might be categorical attributes. Uh, my example for this is fruit. You can be apples, you can be oranges, you can be bananas. Happily, we just had fruit up there, which made me very happy. The point about categorical data is you can know you are in a category or you are out of a category. So there is no implicit ordering. There are ways you could impose orderings on categorical non-ordered data. But a priori, from the data's point of view, it's just categories, so in or out, as opposed to ordered data. Now, once we have ordered data, well, we can actually continue on and we can say, well, there's some ordering in the data. In one example, with ordinal data, all we have is ordering. So t-shirt sizes are a great example. There are small shirts and medium and large shirts. Everyone knows that medium shirts are in between small and large. But we do not ask the question of what is a large t-shirt minus a small t-shirt undefined. That has no meaning. So there is order, but you can't do full-on arithmetic with ordinal data. The data type where you can is quantitative data. So that's what you normally think of as this is numerical data. You can do full-on arithmetic. So you can ask questions like, if you've made a length measurement, what's 23 inches minus 17 inches? That is a meaningful number. So for tabular data now, we've talked about basically, do you have unordered or ordered or full-on quantitative data? What else is there? <coughs> well, for one thing, we might say, well, what if, going back to our spreadsheet metaphor, we want to somehow talk about links between the columns of this data. Then we want to think about relational data. So not just the individual columns, but how could we express some kind of linkage between items? So let's call that relational. And then finally, in contrast to everything else I just talked about, there is true spatial data. So this is data that actually is intrinsically about position, whether that's geographic latitudes and longitudes, or three-dimensional positions in space like you would get with an MRI scan. So the key thing is, I'm often going to talk about spatial as opposed to abstract. So here I'm using abstract to mean non-spatial data. All right. So having talked about data types, now let me leap into visual encoding. So here I'm showing you four different pictures. And I'd like to say, OK, let us analyze these pictures in terms of how we are showing some kind of abstract data dimension. So we've got data like I just talked about with data types. How many of these abstract dimensions could we actually encode in the picture? So we can stare at this a while. There might be a lot of ways we could talk, think about this. I'm going to have us start to think about analyzing this as a combination of what I'll call marks and channels. So let's talk about what those are. So in what's called image theory, which grew out of the work of French semantician Bertin in the 60s, and it's been uh, continually refined since then, there's this idea that there's a mark you could make, a geometric primitive. So the zero-dimensional case is a point. The one-dimensional case is a line. The two-dimensional case is an area. So given these geometric primitives, what can we do to them to control their appearance? That's what we're going to call visual channels. So this could be things like the spatial position of the marks, either horizontally or vertically or both for a planar spatial position. It could be things like color or the orientation or tilt, uh, the size, whether it's uh, area or volume, uh, shape. So there's a lot of, this is not even an ex a complete list. This is just a few of them. So once we have this vocabulary of a mark, which is a geometric primitive, and channels which control their appearance, now we can go back 
and think about how it is that we can analyze these visual encodings using marks and channels. So, of course, what we've got on the left is a bar graph. Breaking that down, we're using the mark type of a line, and we're encoding one abstract data dimension using the visual channel of vertical position. Once we move to a scatter plot, we've switched to a point mark, and now we're using both vertical and horizontal spatial condition to encode two abstract data dimensions. We can add color to that, so that's using a third abstract dimension and adding the visual channel of color. And then here we've added one more visual channel of size, and now we're encoding four abstract dimensions. So there's a bunch of questions you might start to ask. How did we decide to use these particular visual channels? How many visual channels are there? What kinds of information can they convey? How much information can they convey? Are some better than others? Can we use them independently, or do they ever stomp on each other? So let's think about these. So the fundamental breakdown with visual channels is what's the type? This is actually built into our perceptual systems. How do we interpret information we see with these channels? And one set of channels is what we can call the what or the where channels. So with these what, where channels, these are things like, well, clearly planar position is not surprisingly going to be aware. That says where is something. And the rest of these channels, like the hue for the color, so is it, so you'd say, what color is it? Is it red? Is it blue? Is it yellow? Is it purple? You can say, what shape is that, a circle or a square? You can say, what's the pattern? Is it a dashed line or a dotted line? More generally, let's call that the stipple pattern, if we think not just about lines but areas. So these are the visual channels that we intrinsically interpret as telling us what something is. In contrast, there are other visual channels, in fact, pretty much all the rest of them, that don't tell us what something is. They tell us how much of something. So we're also seeing things like position, either along a common scale or an unaligned scale. And so position can tell us you know, what place is this in, sorry, how, um, how much of something there is. Is this length longer or shorter than another? So we have length. We have things like or, uh, how much tilt does something have? Uh, how large is the angle? So um, how much is the size of something? So there's area, curvature, volume. Things like, notice how I've actually separated out color here. I've separated out this, what I'll technically call hue, which is, is it purple or red or blue, from grayscale lightness. So that's, sorry, my gray's a little washed out here, but um, you can think of it as luminous contrast. Gray is always in between black and white. Color saturation, so pink is in between, again, sorry for the washout, pink is in between red and white. So we're separating out luminance, Saturation, color saturation from hue. Notice how the luminance and the saturation are how much, whereas the hue is a what. Uh, things like stipple density. So, so first of all, there's the what versus the how much. Now, this should make you think of something. We just saw data taxonomy where we had categorical data that's very well suited for these what channels. And in contrast, if you have ordered data, whether it's ordinal or quantitative, and you need to express that ordering intrinsically with the perceptual system, you would like that to be one of these how much ordered channels. Otherwise, if you start uh, flipping in between, you'll start either to express something that's not in the data, or there's something in the data that you don't even have the ability to express. So you want to be really careful not to imply ordering that doesn't exist and to be able to show it where it does. Now there's another thing we'd like to do, again, with the perceptual system, which is show some idea of something's in a group, so some kind of grouping. And there are a lot of ways to show grouping, for example, enclosure or containment, where we're actually surrounding things in an area. Connection in one dimension, so literally drawing a line between things, that's of course a fundamental way we show networks. Um, in general, there's similarity, in fact, using any of these other channels, even channels like uh, motion, uh, you heard a bit about the uh, Gestalt principles. So uh, common fate is the similar motion. There's also similar color. And then, of course, there's proximity, which is things that are close together. You intrinsically, with your visual system, consider to be grouped together. 